to me is just like it happened yesterday. I got up and did my regular thing, get ready for work, got my lunch can, went out the door. And I lived on Ford Street and I could see down Blue Acres. I seen lights down there. I pulled up to the, the Mountie that was sitting there and he said, where are you going? I said, I'm going to work. He says, well, the mine blew up this morning. It's just like a brick hit in my chest. Miners were uh, at work, they're getting ready to end their shift. The shift is winding down and there was a concern about the coal dust within the mine. There's stories that it was up to, you know, near knee deep in some of the areas where the, the coal dust was. Workers were scared, everybody was concerned, but yet the regulators and yet the employer did nothing. My uh, husband, John Holland, he was a miner. He was only 33. We were two months shy of our fourth wedding anniversary. We were looking for him to getting home that day. That was Saturday before Mother's Day. And um, we had just the weekend before christened our baby. We can't forget what happened here. It's wrong that it took place. And this memorial park is here so that we don't forget. There's 26 beautiful cherry trees around the perimeter of the park. They blossom once a year. And that's a stark reminder of what happened to each of these 26 miners. What we've done uh, at Westray as Steelworkers is really shows what we can do when we make a commitment and we follow through on it. In terms of uh, committing to the families and the community and workers everywhere that there would be no more Westrays. Now 30 years uh, after the disaster, and 20 years after getting the Westray Bill passed in Parliament, we're still fighting to protect workers and uh, make workplaces safe and healthy so that no worker has to uh, be seriously injured or die on the job. The steelworkers took 10 or more years lobbying to get the criminal code changed so that corporations and corporate executives could be held accountable when they injure and kill workers on the job. Our message is we have the law in the books. We know that workers get injured and killed on the job and we know that in some cases, definitely more than are prosecuted, we believe that that law should be enforced. There should be accountability for those workers and for their families and that that's also a deterrent for other companies and corporate executives not to put their workers uh, at risk for a profit or a production. Quelqu'un, ça reste un, un acte criminel, mais qui doit se transposer aussi dans les cas euh, d'accidents de travail où il est prouvé que c'est de la responsabilité de l'employeur, où ce que c'est prouvé euh, que c'est de la négligence de l'employeur. Si cette négligence-là euh, cause le décès d'un travailleur ou d'une travailleuse, je pense que ça doit être un réflexe des différents corps policiers au Québec de penser à tout le moins euh, à déposer des charges criminelles contre les gestionnaires puis contre les propriétaires de ces entreprises. I'm going to invite each of our panelists to make a few remarks about their experience of health and safety in the workplace. So to start perhaps with uh, Sylvia, would you like to uh, say a few sure, words? Thank you, Andrew. Good morning, everyone. My name is Sylvia Boyce, and I'm the Health and Safety Coordinator for the United Steelworkers Union. Health and safety is a really important issue to the steelworkers. Our union has a reputation of being known as the Health and Safety Union, and it's our union that's been instrumental in making sure that there are proper laws in place to protect all workers across the country. But what I would like to say for students in high schools, it's so important that you exercise your three rights, your right to know, your right to participate, your right to refuse. The steel workers want to ensure when you go to work in the way you went in, that you come home in that same manner, unharmed, safe and health. Until there's no more workers killed on the job, we're not gonna stop and it's important. 
And what happened here is our message to the rest of the country so that we'll never forget. It's nice to see some young workers here. I think it's important to, to talk together with us to learn because the safety habits you form when you're young, you'll carry that with you for the rest of your life. As a local, we probably spend about three months fighting over the language in our contract. The wages might be a week or two at the end. The language is what you need to vote on because the language is what gives us the ability to hold the company responsible for what they've done. And if you're just going in there voting on, on, on the raise, like you said, you're making an extra $2 an hour and you get hurt and there's no language in there to hold that company accountable, it, it really didn't pay off. So my advice to you is when you go to work, wherever you go to work, as a mechanic or you go to work, it doesn't matter where you go to work. Nothing should be more important than you making sure you get home at the end of the day with your health. That's got to be the most important thing. And when you stand up to your employers, you stand up to your co-workers who ridicule you because you just don't suck it up and come to work like everybody else or do a dangerous job, that's when our culture is going to change. It'll never be health and safety, we've got it, it's over. It is a continual fight every day that our members and activists do, our union does. When a person dies at work, is killed at work, it's got to be treated as a crime scene. If we're not successful in treating the, it as a crime scene with the RCMP or the police and or the uh, ministry people that show up, you know, at the end of the day, the evidence, it's all about the evidence for a prosecution to be successful. When the evidence isn't looked after, when it's tarnished, when it's not treated as a crime scene, that uh, our chances of success are greatly reduced. Je pense que dans le futur aussi, euh, on doit aussi solliciter euh, les, les différents corps de police euh, un peu partout au Canada, mais ici au Québec, je pense que c'est quelque chose qu'on devrait faire, d'aller aussi dans les, euh, à l'École nationale de police euh, pour euh, rencontrer euh, des futurs enquêteurs, des futurs policiers, aller aussi rencontrer euh, des étudiants qui étudient en technique policière dans les différents cégeps au Québec pour les informer justement des dispositions de la loi Westry faire en sorte que ces futurs enquêteurs-là, ces futurs policiers-là puissent avoir comme réflexe, puissent avoir comme réflexe quand il y a un accident de travail grave ou un accident de travail mortel, de pouvoir déposer des charges criminelles contre les employeurs, d'y penser, d'analyser cette possibilité-là qui est, à mon avis, beaucoup trop méconnue. The United Steelworkers campaign Stop the Killing and Enforce the Law continues to press the law enforcement and justice departments to utilize the law that has been in place for all these years. We are calling for more education and resources to be made available to the police and prosecutors so they are better equipped to apply the law. I'm not waiting for another tragedy and then for more people to get off the hook. Yeah, I truly believe that law and if we can make it strong then this is not going to happen again. It's, you know, there will be fear in an employer to keep their workers safe. And that's, that's what I want, <laughs> really, you know, so, because it's not, it's not good, you know, to lose somebody, not, not when they're at work, not when they're providing for me and my young family. Now what's left is all been raised, but in the early morning haze, they say you can still hear the miners singing from their graves. Twenty-six girls, twenty-six lives taken away in a flash of light down that dirty old coal mine. What would they give for one more chance, one last kiss, one last? Six ghosts in the West Stream.